Welcome everybody to the New Fly Fisher. I'm your host, Colin McEwen. I'm up here at Fortress Lake with Phil Rowley, who's one of the top still water fishers in uh, North America. It's a rainy day, it's lousy conditions, and Phil's gonna help me unlock some of the secrets of this lake and how to catch some of the big brook trout. It's gonna be an exciting day of fishing. You'll learn a lot. Stay with us, I know you'll like this. Today we are fishing at an incredible location, Fortress Lake in British Columbia. Lying at approximately 4,400 feet above sea level, it is nestled between four major ice fields and glaciers. In my travels, I can honestly say this is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. The lake is located 90 miles northwest of Golden, BC, near the border with Alberta. The rugged snow-capped mountains and aqua blue waters are phenomenal and almost surreal. Best of all, the lake is filled with huge brook trout, averaging in size from three to six pounds. The largest specimen caught so far weighed in at an incredible 11 and a half pounds. Fortress Lake was originally a barren body of water as a result of high snow melt and a series of impassable canyons and waterfalls. In the 1930s, game wardens from nearby Jasper Park delivered by horseback plantings of huge Nipigon River coaster brook trout. The lake remained virtually untouched for almost 70 years. The trout are the only fish in the lake, and they're huge. Access is almost impossible without the assistance of a helicopter. There is one small bicycle route along a treacherous and challenging trail, and includes fording several cold glacier melt rivers. Fly fishers interested in daring to try this trail must be very wary of grizzly and black bears, which abound in the area, as this is one of their main travel corridors. Fortress Lake Wilderness Lodge is run by Paul Leeson and a small, dedicated group of guides. This is the only camp authorized within Hamburg Provincial Park, which was designated as a World Heritage Site by the United Nations. The food is great, the accommodations wonderful, and there's lots to see and do, but the reason we've come here is the huge brook trout. Joining me for a week of fly fishing at Fortress Lake is Phil Rowley. Phil is one of the gurus of stillwater fishing on the West Coast. The author of numerous articles and a best-selling book, Phil is probably best known for being on the speaking circuit teaching people about still water techniques. Today Phil is going to start by teaching me some basics of still water fly fishing and also how anglers have to adapt based on weather conditions and the mood of the fish. Now Phil, can you explain a little bit about, like we, we've seen a few fish in here, but can you explain a little bit how your presentation is being done and then of course I, I see the biggest problem you're going to have if you hook a fish in here you got to get them away from that timber or else they're going to get you wrapped and broken off but yet that's one of the reasons why we've uh, chosen the indicator um, we've got obviously some challenging um, conditions here first of all the weather is off um, we've been we found some fish in here we can see them they're milling around very slowly they don't appear to be all that active so we're trying an, a near static presentation with them and again, as you pointed out, we have that timber in there that's just um, a real challenge any other way. And with this indicator, we're able to suspend our fly, a small leech in this case, just above all that trouble. And hopefully with a couple of strips, just make that marabou tail of the leech dance enough that uh, one of these sort of dour fish will find just too much to resist. But we'll just keep our eyes on that little orange ball and see if something pulls it under. Now, what we're looking for here, it's kind of a light colored bottom and, and usually brook trout are very hard to see. Um, however, what we're seeing is the movement more than we're seeing the fish. Yeah, the odd dark shape, but for the most part you just see a hint of movement that just catches your eye. And you were saying something to me earlier because uh, I commented about, you know, we've, we've seen a bald eagle here on the lake and uh, I was thinking that these fish were being awfully brave getting that close, but then we forget it's so clear here that they're probably 12 feet down when we're seeing them, so they're actually safe. Yeah, but they're still spooky. We've had a couple come by the boat and they, they've looked up and seen us and bolted out of here, so they're certainly aware of their surroundings. 
Now this rig, you can use this for uh, quite a few different patterns. I mean, yeah. uh, well, I, mean I think we're all familiar with you and uh, Brian Chan using these for uh, chrominids, but there's a lot of other applications in there. Yes, there is. Chrominids are the first um, choice, and this is where this method became popular. Leeches work well. Um, you can use it fishing scuds. It's a very effective technique at the late fall. Let's see if we can catch his attention. Now this is where good polarized glasses are so important for us to be able to spot these fish. Oh, it's just not polarized, it's also the color of the glass you've got in there, right? Yeah, well, today we're wearing amber. It seems to be working very well for these overcast conditions. What's the length of the leader you like to use when you're uh, still water fishing in, in these types of depths, you know, 15 feet and under? Well, with this indicator, that's probably about the depth of leader you want to use is about 15 feet, um, any longer than that. And oh, there, there we, we go. go. See how well slowly done. that drew under, though. He didn't take that very well at all. No. Again, uh, just to further confirm our suspicions that they're not in the greatest of moods. But he must have just leisurely yep. cruised over and opened his mouth and started to swim away with it, and that indicator starts to, to pull away. You know, the thing is, Phil, I, there's another fish still over there. I can still see the other one just to the right of there. This guy was probably closer to this uh, fallen tree. Yeah, he might. Well, sometimes that happens. You think you've got one, and somebody else comes over and says, not, not really. This is a little guy, but... Uh, a That's probably about the smallest one we've caught on this lake. <laughs> yeah. It's only about and two and a half pounds. Yeah. Oops, there we go. Looks like the average fish on this lake is about three and a half, four pounds. And then, of course, the fantasy fish are the seven, eight, nine pounders. That's a beautiful fish. I love the colors in that one. Oh, yeah. Just beautiful silver at this time of year. And that fly just flipped right out of his mouth. Outstanding. Oh, well done. Works well. Let's see if we can get that other one in there. Yeah, because I can still see him. He's just on the edge there of those uh, weeds. Now, what was the pattern you used there? It's a uh, egg-sucking sparkle leech. I, we had got one on the uh, copper bead-headed dubbed leech, the dazzle leech, but uh, my thoughts were that maybe that little orange head might stand out a little better. And So far, it's one for one, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see. Maybe that's a, a better it's a color uh, that they seem to like. Oh, we finally managed to hook one here. Brain squalls moved in. Probably put them off a little bit with that change of barometric pressure. Hopefully we can get this one to the net. There we go. Take our rookie. Roll them upside down, calms them right down. Lubricate that pump, but the bulb is empty. Whoop. The bulb is empty. Just insert the tube down the throat. Vacuum forms. And do another one, because I don't think we got anything out of that, which is... There we go. Look at the colors on that. We'll just roll that around. There he goes. Let's take our white container, and I filled it full of water. And I'm going to actually use the water here to vacuum up and then eject the stomach contents. And as you can see, empty. This fish is not feeding and it supports sort of the action we're seeing right now with little in the way of uh, hatch activity or fish activity. We're having to get them on streamer patterns and use retrieves that are slow in nature yet use patterns with enough uh, animation that. Uh, will prey on their naturally aggressive tendencies. They are, after all, apex predators in this environment. One of the most critical things we have to consider in still water fly fishing is depth. What, general, what, a, what a general rule is, is fish are selective on their depth and opportunistic upon what they feed upon. In other words, they're gonna feed upon whatever is most readily available at the depth they're cruising at. And this is where these strike indicators really come in handy. Now, what I've done here is I've approximately set it up for about 12 feet between the indicator and the fly, but there are times when fish are so selective on their depth that we have to set this in a more surgical approach. And how we do that is I've approximately set my indicator again at that 12 feet increment, okay, and I'm going to strip in my fly, 
grab it gently so I don't hook myself. That tail all straightened out. And I'm going to attach a weight. It can be a bell sinker, a slinky, or in this case, fly fisherman's tool, the hemostat, attached to the fly. And I'm going to lower it gently over the side. And it will pull the indicator underneath. And the distance that the indicator is pulled under between the indicator and the surface, the reciprocal of that will be how high the fly suspends off the bottom. Now in this case, I'm probably a bit too long on my lead, as I only have this distance between the surface and the fly, and the indicator rather. So what I'm going to do is readjust. I want to be in this situation, I feel about two feet off the bottom. And set the indicator, big loop there, so I'm going to readjust that. Just set the indicator, put it into place, lower it again, and I'm more comfortable with that setup. I have about 24 inches or so between the indicator and the surface and when that fly is cast my fly will be surgically figured out as to how much I have to put it off the bottom. And this is a great way especially when coronamid fishing the most popular method for using strike indicators um, they can be fished six inches when the hatch is strong six inches will be the uh, difference sometimes because the fish will just it's so efficient to feed at that one level they won't rise a foot in either direction to take the fly. So it's an excellent method for really dialing in how deep your fly is fishing. Provided, of course, you're on a flat shoal. This is not something you'd probably want to do off a drop-off because of that angled taper into deeper water. We decided to go in for a hot lunch at the camp, and as often happens, the weather quickly changed. The skies opened up, and it was suddenly quite sunny and warm. Phil and I went back out, and everything was different we suddenly started catching lots of fish as there were schools of brook trout cruising the flats looking for food. Now, Phil, we should explain to everybody here what we're doing in terms of uh, the setup we have as well as where we're fishing and why we're fishing. Could you talk a little bit about this? Sure. We're in a, a bay here. Um, we've done a little exploring around. We can actually see fish cruising. The water is so clear right now, right after ice off in the early spring here. And we have a very level um, shoal area here, very consistent depth, so no drop-offs to contend with. And the fish are just milling around. They've been a little inactive. We had some very uh, ugly weather yesterday, if you can remember. So they're probably a little coming out of that, the uh, slumber that sort of puts them in their inactive state. And we're using a, a technique that's commonly used uh, when we're fishing coronamids and coronamid larvae, and that's suspending a fly under a strike indicator. And what we've done here is we've taken a, a size 6 egg sucking sparkle leech here and we're just uh, hanging it under there and we're allowing the wind to sweep it into position here and then every once in a while I'm giving it a 6 to 12 inch pull just to pull that fly up and let it flutter down a very natural motion and you'll just see that indicator either draw off to the right or left or pull under and that's a brookie grabbing the fly and it's a very effective way um, to work over these sort of inactive fish. We just had to grab a minute ago and I lost them so let's see if we can buckle down and get another one going here. Phil was gracious enough to say, go ahead, Colin, you cast to that fish. And here we are. I wasn't there more than, what, two minutes? Not even that, 30 seconds, and that went under. The indicator released, and... Yep. I say it's a great method. We've got a nice drift going through here. Uh, that breeze is just sweeping the fly through the area, and the Fish just swim up to it lazily and think it's just some poor unfortunate leech that's not moving very fast. Nice fish, yeah. bright silver. And I said, Colin, not only leeches, in, um, chronomid pupa and uh, larva limitations is where this really, uh, this method cut its teeth, but we can use it on not only those items, leeches as we're doing here today, scuds, caddis pupa, Basically, any pattern you want to suspend, it's an excellent fall tactic when trout are in shallow uh, foraging or amongst you know, weeds and timber like this, and we can keep our flies out of trouble and not be so costly on the fly box. 
winds really just picked up here in the last yeah. three seconds. Okay, I'm gonna get this guy in. Yeah, and that actually is gonna help us. It's gonna help present the fly and mask our presence. So, a little bit of winds, not bad. A lot of wind, well, <laughs> we'll go find hiding places. Okay, nice average size brookie. And you can see that uh, egg -sucking, uh, sparkle leads firmly planted in the upper jaw which is a common hook um, placement uh, when you're catching these fish, because as soon as they grab it, we're onto them and we yeah. jam it right in their upper here. nose. Bring them over here, Phil. Get your anchor up there. Yeah, got him around. Okay. Bring his head up now. Yeah. Scrappy, aren't they? Yeah. Just when you think you got them, they're gone this, again. This isn't even a big one. This no. is what, about two and a half pounds? Yeah. Maybe very three. healthy, very bright. I'll let you do the honors. You want to pop that out? Yeah. Let you reset at that 10 foot depth that seems to. Okay, you're free. I'm going to do a throat pump on them. Use the, the daylight. I can't get through. Beautiful. Outstanding. Well done, Colin. That's my first one. This is a great, great technique, Phil. Well, that's a smashing spot because they will uh, cruise that edge. Well, that's where, remember, yeah. we saw the clump of them there? Yeah. Dark backs on that green background. And... There you got one. Nice one, Phil. <sighs> We're just hammering them here. Just hammering them. Why don't you bring them around over here? Okay. And if you can push me, push the net towards me, I'll. Okay. I'll land this one okay. for you. Okay. Let's bring them over this way. That's a nice fish. Nice and thick. Yes. Well done, Cole. Okay. Get up still here, my friend. Now just flip them over here. And get the fly out of his mouth. Actually, you got my little scats there. Yeah. He's got it in his mouth a bit. Um, oh, here. I got it right here. Oh. It's the, you get really good hook sets because you sit in the upper jaw. You know, it's got it a bit in his mouth, actually. Yeah. Kind of inhaled it. He might have been racing another fish to get at it. Yeah, that's another good reason this method works so well. And uh, you've got a little bit of competition. Greed kicks over. So. Take this guy. Take it. Oh, look how thick that is. They're healthy, aren't they? Yeah. Thank you. Oh, outstanding. Well done. Okay. And one of the things I think that's uh, important to talk about here, Phil, is that the methods we're using right now to catch these fish, um, people can use this for bass, they can use this for trout, they can use it for a lot of different species oh, throughout Canada and the United States. Certainly. It's basically just a method of uh, suspending a fly uh, in such a way that you don't uh, um, lose it to the structure. And when you're faced with a fishing situation where trout are really focused on a specific depth. Oh, oh, missed him. Oh, missed him. Phil took some time during a break in the weather to tie one of the flies that is a consistent producer for him. The egg-sucking sparkle leech is a popular pattern that seems to work everywhere. Okay, I'm going to tie a... Uh, sparkle leech, an egg sucking sparkle leech, and into the vise I placed a size 6 must add R74 hook onto, it a, onto which I have slid a hot orange cone. I'm going to attach the black 8 dot tying thread behind the bead, pull down on the thread and snap forward to break it away, save you using your scissors and cover that hook shank with tying thread so we have good traction for our materials. Go about halfway up and let the thread hang. I've taken three strands of UV crystal flash 
bound them down at about the midpoint of the shank and then sweep all of the fibers back over, doubling themselves, and secure them into the position trailing along the back of the shank. I'm going to trim them at staggered lengths so they shimmer throughout the marabou tail. And that's prepared. I'm going to carry my tying thread up behind the bead. And I'm going to take a black marabou plume and off the one side I'm just going to strip down and fold the plumes onto themselves like such to make one big long plume off the side. I want the tail to be nice and long so I've got a measure for the tail to be at least the hook shank and up to the bead. I've trimmed the marabou, tie it in directly behind the bead to keep a nice smooth body contour. And with open turns, bind that marabou all the way down the hook shank. I have a long flowing tail. It'll blend in. I can moisten that to keep it all together. Okay, the marabou tail is uh, in place along with that crystal flash. And for the body, we're just simply going to use some crystal chenille in black. I'm going to use my thumb and forefinger to expose the thread core, bind that in place right down at the base of the tail, and then quickly carry my thread with open turns right the way up to that bead. Now I'm just going to wind the body. tight wraps using my left thumb and forefinger to sweep those crystal chenille fibers. You can even take the crystal chenille and spin it a few times like that to make those individual fibers stand out even more. When this gets in the water, it catches light really well, it provides a great silhouette. The rookies can hone in on it. Tie that off, trim away the excess. And finally, to take our whip finisher, number of wraps directly behind, and we'll apply some head cement later on when they're all done. And there you have it, a simple egg sucking sparkle leech. Okay, I'm gonna get it out of here. Now, he's got it right here in the corner. Good job. Here we go. All right. Oh, there you go. Oh, well, there you go. There's a nice smooth release. Well, thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. It's been great having you on the show. Oh, it's been a wonderful experience. And from all of us here at the New Fly Fisher, thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you next week. Hi, I'm Mark Melnick. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, hit the like button and subscribe today. Now we're putting up brand new videos all the time. So if you want to be notified when a new one goes up, click that bell icon and it'll come to you as soon as it's uploaded. Mm -hmm.